because of his faithfulness. If you have small children, welcome. If he's been awesome to you, then you ought to praise him right now. What an awesome God we serve. Holy, mighty, great, protector, deliverer, my all in all, my everything. I magnify you right now. Well, there is none like you in the universe. I'm so glad that when I got up this morning, I got up with a mind stayed on you. I've come to worship you and to magnify you. I thank you for a reasonable portion of health and strength. Thank you that my name is written on the Lamb's book of life. Thank you that salvation is mine. Because of your son Jesus, I bless you today. Blessed be the God of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for this great opportunity. Thank you for being so faithful for 40 years. You're just a faithful God. A wonderful, a mighty, a marvelous God. Touch our hearts today and reveal yourself to us in this service. Come and magnify yourself among and in our midst. We know what we've already studied, Lord, that wherever you are, your body is, there you are in the midst of us. So right now, you're right in the midst of your people. We're glad you're here today. We know that when you show up, demons tremble, angels prostrate fall, bondages are broken, doors are open, chains are thrown off. In the name of Jesus, for there is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved other than the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that blessed name. Anything in our life that's not like you, we voluntarily and readily confess and declare that we are wrong and you are right. We can come boldly to your throne and find help in the time of need. So now, we place the service in your hands. For these few short moments, we want to hear what you have to say to us and then give the praise that is due your name. Thank you now. It's in your hands. In the name of the Father. Of the Son of the Blessed Holy Ghost. Praise God. And amen. Go ahead and be seated. I'm so glad you're here. I always try to discern what the Lord wants to say to me about preaching, and this is usually revealed through my reading of the Word of God or some biblical book. But I recently received a strong spiritual impetus that I really ought to be talking about thankfulness. And that brought to mind six times that the Apostle Paul exploded into the exclamation, thanks be to God. Thank God for the salvation of the Romans in Romans 6 and 17, where he said, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Thanks be to God. Thank God for the answer to this body of death, which is Jesus Christ. You're messed up right now. We're stuck in this body, but the answer is Jesus. Amen. Romans 7.25 says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, my, my flesh, the law of sin. Thanks be to God. Thank God for giving us the ultimate victory in Christ Jesus. Y'all better come on and get with me because I'm about ready to go home. I'm going to shout and go on home. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 said, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking for uh, some people who are victors right now. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, whoa, whoa. I didn't say victim. I said victors. Thanks be to God. That he has given us continual triumph, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. So as Christ is leading you right now, you seem to be lost. You're not, not sure where you are. You're wandering around and it looks dark. He's leading you into triumph. And manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. He thanked God for fellow workers, 2 Corinthians 8, 16. But thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf 
in the heart of Titus. And finally, he thanked God for the indescribable gift that is in the person of Jesus the Christ. 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thanks, thankfulness and thanksgiving are central to the Christian life. I was reading in the Orthodox Study Bible this morning during my devotion. You say every devotion on Sunday morning, have devotion every morning. I, I used to do it and then on the weekend kind of take off anymore. I'm just in devotion, devotion all the time. Every day of my life, I get up and give two hours to God of reading and devotion. They say you do that on cr Christmas, Easter, uh, Halloween. Every holiday, all doesn't matter. Every day because he's been too good to me. And so, to set the stage for understanding the centrality of thankfulness and thanksgiving to the Christian life, I want to remind us of the cultural context that is the backdrop to thankfulness in the text of the, con, uh, of the New Testament. You have the text, the written text that have been written and gathered and inscripturated, and you have the context, the backdrop behind those. The concept of thankfulness has to do with the New Testament context of favor. Go ahead and somebody say favor. Unfortunately, we cannot understand that thankfulness on that thanksgiving, that favor, that grace, anything in the New Testament without understanding the Jewish context behind those concepts. Now, that's not new to you. I've talked about it, talked about the anthropological perspective of the first century circum-Mediterranean culture. But I read a new book. So somebody said, what else is new? I read another book. And in this particular book, a Messianic Jew begins to talk about the importance of the Jewish context. I'm going somewhere. He, must, he said, wrote, you must understand the existing or existing manuscripts of the early church point convincingly to its Jewish roots. The original language, idioms, custom, original organizational structure, religious practices, scriptures of the early church are all Jewish. Records confirm the first 15 pastors of the original Jerusalem church are Jewish. The earliest songbook used by Christians known as the Ode of Solomon accentuates the fact that Christianity was not only born alongside of, but in the matrix, in the womb, in the milieu of the religion of Judaism. When you come to the law and its many references in the New Testament, you have writers throughout history that argue against many of the misconceptions that have hindered the accurate study of the Jewish origin of the church. And when you have an understanding of the proto-rabbis, the first rabbis before A.D. 70, before the fall of Jerusalem, and the Pharisees, you cannot deny the influence of these people upon the church. Hence, the early church was Jewish and a fixed part of early Judaism in which Jesus and Paul lived. The Bible cannot be read, understood, or expounded without a Hebrew context. Yet we have the holy audacity in America to stand up in our churches and say, we are a New Testament church. You don't understand, do you, that all that's going on goes back to the Jewish Jesus. So what is the specific Jewish context behind the biblical teaching or the thankfulness or on Thanksgiving? The specific Jewish context of thankfulness is a value process called patronage. Have you ever heard of it before? Who's heard of it before? Will you hear of it? Oh, I taught you that? Oh. Well, let's do it again. Because we need either a tune-up or I'm going to set a new context again because it's deep and it's hard to grasp from where we are. The process of patronage comes from the Greek word pater, which means father. The clients were people who were in debt or some other unfortunate circumstance. In the first century, A.D. 0 to 100, circum Mediterranean, all the countries surrounding the Mediterranean uh, uh, Sea, society there is basically the haves and the have-nots. This is a situation that America seems to be moving toward. Right now, we have a middle class, so you have the have, the have-haves, and the have-nots. Okay? In, in the Bible, you got the super rich and the super poor, the haves and the have not. And although the patronage and clientage value system is difficult for us to imagine or understand, we really can't understand the Bible or what it's talking about without being familiar. So let's do it. Oh, by the way, 40th anniversary celebration is just wonderful. 
shift, shift in the atmosphere. God tried to shift something. So go ahead and bump your neighbor and say shift. See, you ain't had to bump them all while I was gone. While I was sitting, y'all had other speakers. But uh, uh, he's back. Although it's difficult. Pilcher Molina said in their book, Biblical Social Values and Meaning, it refers, he's talking about grace or favor, refers to the outcome of the value process called patronage. What clients seek from patrons is favor. Favor for you is called grace. Favor might be defined as receiving something either that could not be otherwise obtained at all or on terms more advantageous than could be otherwise obtained. Favoritism is the main quality of the patron-client relationships in the quote. I'm going to find me a church because I want to go to church where all I got to do is say favor. And folks start shouting. I want to go to a church where all I got to do is say grace. And people fall out in the aisle and don't know what to do because they recognize that but for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here right now. But for the grace of God, I would be dead. I would be lost. If it were not for God's grace, I don't know where I would be right now. So I just sometimes, I, I just like to hear somebody say favor or grace. And when I say grace, I'm not talking about Grace Jones. I'm talking about the grace of God. Favor. And when you talk about favor, you got to talk about favoritism. To understand the Jewish perspective of favoritism, you have to understand that Judaic people view the resources of the world as limited or in being limited supply. So when one is blessed, you have to curse or reduce the resources to everybody else. So when a patron shows favor to somebody, that means that somebody else can't get that favor. So that's called favoritism. When your children say, I think you're showing favoritism, that ain't a good thing. That means you are showing favor over somebody else that if you get the favor, they can't get the favor. This is completely opposite to the way we think, so allow me to work with it a little bit. We live in a society where there are unlimited goods in an open market system. If you want some shoes like mine, Johnson Murphy, by the way, you just simply go out and buy them because there are hundreds, if not thousands of duplicates all over the United States. However, in the Bible, if you want some shoes like mine, you got to get mine. And you got to pray, Lord, kill him so I can have his shoes. That's why I say don't cover your neighbor's, cover your neighbor's wife. Don't cover your neighbor's wife. Because I ain't covered, covered in no wife like you got. Ah, I'm coveting the one you have. That's the context of the Bible's teaching against covetousness. So we are not to covet what belongs to others. But when you look at favoritism with respect to the Old and New Testament, let's see if we can put it in order. God is the patron. He's the father in the Old Testament who shows favoritism to the people of Israel. They receive his fellowship, his friendship, his love, his blessing that they could not get anywhere else. In response, they had to learn to seek God's favor or grace, but it was first the sovereign choice and the sovereign gift of God. That naturally makes the blessing of God favoritism towards one in opposition to all others. God didn't choose all nations in the Old Testament. He chose Israel, and he gave her favor. So therefore, he didn't give the other ones the same kind of of favor in the New Testament in Jesus Christ you and I were chosen before the foundation of the world to be his dearly beloved chosen one to receive the grace of favoritism and in opposition to the Old Testament in the New Testament God wants to show favor to every one of us and Paul captures the grace of favoritism and the wonderful blessings attached to it in a long passage of Scripture which I'm going to read. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. I'm going to use New Living Translation today. 
how we praise God. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we belong to Christ. Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to him through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. So we praise God. For the wonderful kindness that he has poured out on us because we belong to his dearly loved son. He is so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom through the blood of his son. And our sins are forgiven. He has showered his kindness, favor, grace on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God's secret plan has now been revealed to us. It's a plan centered on Christ, designed long ago according to his good pleasure. And this is his plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together. Under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because of Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. And he chose us from the beginning. And all things happen just as he decided long ago. God's purpose was that we who were the first to trust in Christ should praise our glorious God. That's the response to patronage. We'll discuss it later. And now you also have heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us everything he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. This is just one more reason for us to praise our glorious God. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Praise God as you go to your seat. Praise God on the way down. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Because of who he is, Yahweh chose to favor and to show favor to the entire world which was lost. His favor is centered in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Let me stop for a minute and let you know that I'm writing a new book. I don't know when it's going to be out, but it's called Fight for the Faith. Because I believe that many people in America and in most churches have lost the gospel of Jesus Christ and are now preaching motivational messages intended to keep people encouraged or fix their little problems. And some have been asking me the question, they said, Bishop, make sure you don't want to transmit the stuff to people to get their feelings hurt, to think that you don't care about their marriages and you don't care. I care about the gospel. Now, if you want to get your marriage fixed and you, it ain't about Jesus, I don't want you to get your marriage fixed on me. You want to get your singleness fixed so you can go to the, the, the bar on Saturday night, I ain't interested. But if you want Jesus, he will change your life, change your marriage, change your singleness, fix your finances. When you got Jesus, you got everything you need. The problem is not that Jesus has been tried and found wanting. The problem is he hasn't really been tried. But I'm here to testify that when you stretch out on Jesus, that when you allow him to become the center of your life, that there will be a change in your life. God will rearrange some stuff. There will be some transformation in your life. 
He's the patron of the world. And we seek favor from him through our broker, Jesus Christ. He gives us favor we couldn't get anywhere else. It's called grace. How many of you got insurance? If you got insurance, praise God, in this great country of America, generally you have to get that through a broker. The broker will arrange with the insurance company that you get a coverage or insurance. Jesus is the broker with heaven. He will arrange that you have the, what you need from God the Father. He's the one that brokers the deal. I can't get no help in here. You didn't get to Jesus on your, or God on your own. You got to him through Jesus Christ. He was God manifest in the flesh. And since he was God in the flesh, he knows where we are because he's in the flesh. He knows where God is because he's divine. And Jacob said he saw a ladder sitting on the earth who's high, who, who reached into the heaven. So he began to bridge both earth and heaven. He saw angels going up and down. If you want to get to heaven, you got to climb the ladder of Jesus Christ. That if you want to have and touch God, you got to come by Jesus. And when you have Jesus, you have everything you need. I, I can't preach this morning, but I'm too excited about what I got in the name of Jesus. So I'm preaching in case you don't know what I'm preaching. The death, Paul said, the burial, the resurrection, the post-resurrection appearances, the ascension of Jesus Christ who was caught up in the heaven for the forgiveness of sins so that people might be saved, so that there might be transformation in their life. I'm not preaching the NAACP, forgive me. I'm not preaching the Urban League. I'm not preaching Oprah. I'm not preaching Ebony. I'm not preaching the Beacon Journal. I'm preaching Jesus. If you don't want Jesus, you're in the wrong place. I'm hoping that Jesus will come and get down inside of you and become the center of your life. The Patriots client's his relationship is a mutually obligating covenant. Once you seek God's favor, it obligates God. And obligates him. And he has to give you mercy anytime you ask for it. Now, I grew up in some Baptist church, a lot of Pentecostalism, and they believe they can obligate God when they get ready. They'll go get some promises, twist them up, and make God do what they want him to do. Oh, I've been, oh, God, you said, you said in your word, you will supply my need. I'm glad Pastor Jenkins fixed that, straightened that out. He said he will supply all of your needs after you take care of the pastor. That's what the context said. But we go get it, twist it all up, and you know I need a car. And so you're going to twist it and make God. God is not obligated to do anything for you. He's free. But there's one thing he is obligated to do, and that's give you mercy. Anytime you ask, let me say that I, there's some, I just need mercy on an ongoing basis. Me. I'm just talking about me. But there are times when I look at my life that I have to say, Lord, have mercy. That goes back to the Baptist church. Y'all don't know that. There are times when you have to say, Lord, have mercy. When you look at your finances, some of y'all ought to say. When you look at your kids, some of us ought to say, Lord, have mercy. When you're going in to get a bad doctor's report, you got to say, have mercy. When somebody says something that you don't like, and in your mind you can see yourself slapping them, you got to say, Lord, have mercy. And I want you to know that God is obligated to give you mercy. Before you can get the words out your mouth, before you can get the prayer up, before it ascends to heaven, God is saying, I got mercy for you. Grace, grace, grace. I can't preach this morning. I got too much to talk about. But grace, grace. 
grave. The old preacher would say if I was in the Baptist church this morning, woke me up this morning. Grace started me on my way. Grace gave me a reasonable portion of health and strength. Grace. Oh, I got to stop. Let me stop. Mercy, mercy is technically the favor of God towards those who are in covenant with him. The favor of God towards those who are in covenant. Justice is getting what you deserve. Don't ever ask God for justice. Because by rights, injustice, you deserve hell. Now, when we say that, we're in church and everybody's going to say amen, but you don't believe that. That's not what you really believe. That's just a nice theological statement. You deserve hell. And if you deserve hell, everything you get is grace and gravy. But that's not what you really believe, because at work, you be over there talking about, I, I can't understand, I don't work, I, I, I didn't get no raise for 2013, I can't understand, hard as I work, that they can't, that's not, that's not, you deserve hell, that is, I deserve a raise, okay, so that's what you really think, but underneath, I want you to understand, what you really deserve is hell. The fact that you got a job, praise God. The fact that you got paid last week, thank you, Lord. The fact that you gave me a reasonable portion of health and strength, thank you. I'm blessed. Can, can I? So justice, I'm going to tell this really corny joke. I don't tell jokes, but this joke has a good punchline to help you understand. There's a woman that went and got her picture took it, taken, and she didn't like it. So he told the photographer, I don't like this picture. Don't do me justice. He said, lady, with a face like yours, you don't need justice. You need mercy. <laughs> justice. <laughs> takes what it sees. Justice is what you get what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you do not deserve. When we seek God's favor, we put our trust in Jesus, the broker, the deal, make a deal with the Father. We enter into a series of covenant relationships. Jesus becomes our elder brother and our broker. The Father becomes our patron. The Spirit becomes our comforter, our helper. The, the, the Orthodox teach that the church becomes our mother. And I'm, I'm going to do some more on that because the reason you can walk away from us like you do because you ain't our we not your mother. The Holy Spirit is my mother. No, the Holy Spirit is your comforter. The Holy Spirit resides in the church, the body of Jesus Christ, which is your mother. Yeah. Killed every amen right there. And other believers and become your brothers and sisters. All right, so go ahead and turn. You ain't had the chance to do this all while the mother speaker was there. Go on and greet your brother and sister on there. He said, go ahead. You don't even want to touch him. Don't look at me. What's up, brother? What's up, sister? That's why we call you in the church. What? Brother? Sister? Now, I'm going a little deep now. We had some shouting, then I'm going to come back and shout some more, try to get you out before, because I feel I'm so, I, I mean, I didn't preach last Sunday. I got energy. <laughs> Have vacation, didn't preach, and I'm, I'm ready to go. All of this can be boiled down into one word God is releasing me to start talking about now. You can take the whole Christian life and boil it down to one word. Loyalty. God is loyal to you. What does that mean? That means no matter how messed up you are, he don't leave you. No matter how messed up you are, when you say, Lord, have mercy, he gives you mercy. That's loyalty. God is loyal to us. 
That's what covenant is. It's loyalty. Now, not only is there an obligation on God's part, but there's an obligation on our part. The obligation on our part is also called loyalty. Let me ask you a question. How loyal are you to God? Now, we always asking him, Lord, where are you, Jesus? I, I need you right now. Mm. It's funny how people who don't even look like they know God, when they get in trouble, can start moaning like a Baptist deacon at 80 years old. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know you knew God. All of a sudden, a moan comes up deep from the inside. But how loyal are you when we say it's unfortunate that we call grace and favor the unmerited favor of God? That's unfortunate. Because it, in our value system, that means it's free. And that's how we take it. It's free. But when we say that God, the Father's favor is unmerited, I want to go on record right now. I want you to hear me. Favor is never free. Now, y'all like T.D. Jakes. Jake said, favor ain't fair. So when stuff is going on in your life and God steps in and shows you favor and your neighbor sitting right next to you is jealous, you just turn and look at him and say, favor ain't fair, baby. It ain't fair. I don't know what I did to deserve it. I don't know why God did it, but that's up to him. It ain't fair. What he does for me not, might not do the same thing for you. But guess what? So it won't seem fair to you. But not only is favor not fair, favor is never free. Now, we're in trouble right now because I'm preaching against everything you know. Because everything you've ever heard is the unmerited favor of God. Grace, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, the unmerited favor of God. Grace, that comes to you freely when you have. No, it's not free. Never has been free. Never will be free. You ought to be messed up right about now. Hilcher Molina right, considering the cultural presuppositions of, a, of all goods are limited and the debt of gratitude involved in giving, it was seen that really there were no free gifts in the ancient world. No free gifts. You know, I ain't even got to go to the ancient world. I can go right here. When somebody starts giving you gifts, you got to really take a hard look at some of them gifts and ask yourself, what's coming next? Because sometimes when people give you a gift, they are some strings attached to them gifts huh you got the gift walking away don't know that string is on string is on there gonna pull you back I want something I'm giving you something but I want something that's how a lot of your friends are that's why you get in trouble yeah sure yeah you took they took you out to dinner but they waiting on you to reciprocate so let me start keeping records I think I paid last time. <laughs> Friends don't keep account. When I go out with friends, we fight over the check. Because we're friends. When we left Friday night and went to dinner, went to a nice restaurant, we were there. We were talking at the table. I said something, Pastor Jenkins jumped up, shouting, woo, and walked to the back. I don't know what was wrong with him. I said, the Holy Ghost didn't got a hold of him. He went back over there, stood for a while, and came back. I'm getting ready to go. I asked the lady, can I have the check? She said, someone has already taken care of it. I said, who? Where? Where did they take care of it? Who did that? I mean, I am slow. I'm out the door at home. I said, my wife, did you, did you take care of this church? She said, Pastor Jenkins, I, didn't you see him? <laughs> no, I thought he was shouting. I don't know what he went over there for. I thought I had said something so good. I didn't know the man was going over to pay for the check. 
Friends don't keep accounts. Yet, in the world, there seems like there's no free gifts. In the ancient world, there were no free gifts. All gifts implied obligation to the giver. God's grace, his willingness to be patron, implies a vertical social standing since only the haves can give in and serve as patrons for the have not. Being a patron supposes a want, a need, a favor on the part of the client, but the baptism of John and Jesus' kingdom are premised on the need of a favor. I need a favor. Now, there are a lot of y'all in here don't need no favor, so let me talk for me. I need a favor. I was in sin. There was no way for me to get out. I need a favor. My, my name was all messed up. I was on my way to hell. I need a favor. I was messed up from the floor up, and I needed somehow to get out, and there was nobody who could help me. The devil wouldn't help me. Other folks wouldn't help me. The world wouldn't help me. The church folks wouldn't help me. I had to get to Jesus who could broker a favor for me so I could get out of where I was at. So in the first place, although we talk about the unmerited favor of God, it ain't free. It costs Jesus. He had to pay the price. And then you need to understand it wasn't unmerited. It was demerited. You weren't in negative. You weren't in, in, in zero. And Jesus came along and saw you on zero and added something to your account. You was in negative numbers. You have forfeited. The grace of God. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, Adam and Eve representing all of humanity, had forfeited the grace of God. And that became on our account. And therefore, you are in negative numbers. And God sent Jesus to die on Calvary, to put something in your account, to bring you back up to zero and give you more. It's the demerited favor of God. And so let me work my analogy because on, on, on this morning when I was preaching, the Lord just gave me a little bit of a metaphor that I started working. I said, hmm, that worked good. I think I used that in the second service. Now, let's see if we can understand it. Well, let me go down a little bit more. So when you get grace, you are favored and you are actually as a benefactor, you are need to respond as a beneficiary. Have you ever heard that word before? Yeah, you keep looking at the insurance policy saying, that's me. Beneficiary. There are certain things that need to take place. Now, you got a father. Your father dies. And when he died, as a con. As, as a condition of the will, he left in the will that all your debts would be paid. In addition to all your debts being paid, he, he made another provision that you would receive a million dollars in your account on top of all your debts being paid. I'm just talking about what Jesus did. I mean, what, God, what the father did. And then on top of that, he, he made it so that your credit rating was fixed. See, because even though you might have been, uh, you, you don't have any more debt and you got a million dollars, you don't want to buy everything in cash. You want to use your credit card, but your credit's messed up. So he fixed your credit. You're no longer in debt. You got a million dollars in your account and your credit's fixed on account of your daddy. I can't hear nobody. He just left one condition. The condition is you got to be thankful. Okay, now, everybody in here, when I say you got to be thankful, going to say, I'm thankful, I'm thankful. But how do you show thankfulness? There are three ways that you show thankfulness, and we'll talk about them all during the series. Number one, you have to um, be obedient. That just killed a whole lot of thankfulness right there, didn't it? Did you hear that go down? It was like. Number two. You have to tell everybody you know about what your dad did for you. It's called preaching and witnessing. And number three, you got to give him the honor that's due his name. Okay? Those are the three. We're going to work on them, but I'm just going to work on them lightly right now. 
So those three things you got to do, and they have to be certified by a notary republic. You can't just say, I'm thankful. You can't just say, it's got to be proven if you want to pick up this money. Now, how many of y'all want to pick up your money? To pick up the money, you got to be thankful. Now, remember, when you're thankful, that your brother or your sister standing over there, they ain't thankful. You left him the car. You left me the train set. You left him the house. They're not thankful. But, but the father left to each person what he knew was good for each person. But you're not thankful because you're looking at what somebody, I'm going to preach this thing, somebody, because you, you didn't get what somebody else got, but you got what God had for you, and you wasn't thankful. All right, let's go back to God. Can we go back to God now? Jesus, representing the broker, representing heaven, died for you. In the will, he left you. Number one, you're no longer in debt. Debt of sin has been paid. No longer in debt. Number two, he's added to your account. And now you got grace where before you had debt. I can't hear nobody. I don't say my name. Number three, he fixed your credit report. You are now just as if you had never sinned or ever done anything wrong. Glory! Hallelujah. You didn't get it. If you got it, you'd be shouting. He, everything... He fixed you so that everything you could have done, had done, should have done, thought you had done, is now fixed as if you had never done anything wrong in your life. Debt fixed. Account full. Credit fixed. Now let me hear. Who's thankful? Now, let's talk about it a minute. Let's, let's tell me know how I know you're thankful. So the first way I'm going to know you're thankful, don't worry, you're going to have plenty of time to cover this because I'm going to be working on this for about six messages. That'll take us up to Family and Friends Day. So, I'll be working on it a little bit. We'll look at, you, 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 you're in the office now. You, you're sitting before the lawyer, and you are dispersing the goods. Okay? And we, you got to certify that you're thankful. So, the first thing you got to do is, I obey God, and I'm, I'm for his well-being no matter what. I want to do what he wants me to do. you got to certify that. Number two, you got to tell everybody you know, everybody you run into, what Jesus did for you. You, you, you just waiting on a, a, just a slight, any break in the conversation. And when the break comes, you, you don't say, uh, what do you think about ISIS? You don't say, well, you know, have you, been, have you been watching the National Football League lately? You say, I want to share with you what Jesus did for me. Were it not for Jesus, I wouldn't be standing here right now. Were it not for Jesus. And every place you go, you're telling everybody you know about Jesus. Now, let's, let's make this real. Because when we talk ethereally like that, everybody jumps on board and says, yeah, I'm, I'm with you right there. Let's make it real. Let, let's put a real opportunity there. November, I think it's the second. I'm not sure because I don't keep track of dates like that. Every day that this is the same to me. But uh, I think it's November the second is Family and Friends Day. Family and Friends Day, you don't invite nobody. You don't hardly come yourself. But here's your opportunity to tell everybody you know, I want you to go to church with me on Family and Friends Day because I want to tell you what Jesus has done for me. And I want you to go with me where I heard the word of God that set me free, that allowed me to know who Jesus is in my life. Then you won't be talking about the church and all we got messed up and what we did and what we didn't do, whatever you want to say. I want to take you somewhere where I heard the gospel. I want to take you somewhere where I got set free. I want to take you somewhere where I get the teaching of the word of God. I want to take you somewhere. Just come and go with me to my father's house, to my father's. Oh, let's go back. 
And then, number three, in order to know you are thankful, you're going to give him worship, praise, what's due his name, anytime and all the time, anywhere, all the time. I, I'm not hearing nobody. So that means you sitting across the table from your relative, the relative's mouth is poked out. You getting, you getting all the stuff. Daddy always thought you were special. Okay, and you, but, but remember, you thankful. All you can say is, don't talk about my daddy. He, he's the one that's making it possible for me to pick up this cool million right here, right now. He's the one that set it up for me to be where I am right now. He's the one that looks out. So if you got a problem with him, you have a problem with him. But don't talk to, about, to him about me. Don't be talking to me about him. So that means you're going to be sitting in church sometime. You're sitting on the road with the deadest Christian in the church. Every time you look like you're going to move, they look at you like you better not. You, I dare you to get up and do something. You're going to say, look, I got an inheritance among the sanctified, and I got to praise God. I must praise him because of what he's done for me. You need to understand, in order for me to pick up my inheritance, I got to praise God. I wish I had somebody. So that means we're going to come in here some Sunday morning and it ain't no spirit nowhere and we're trying to conjure up the spirit. Come on, saints, everybody. You know how we do in church. Come on, somebody. Let's praise the Lord. Lift your hands unto God. Lift your holy antennas unto God so that we can uh, come on, somebody. Uh, yeah. And people looking at you like y'all looking at me now. I ain't doing nothing. I don't feel like it. I ain't got no inheritance. I can't crank. I can't get what I need. And you got to be willing to say, I, I'm going to praise God if I hold my peace. The very rocks will cry out. But ain't no rock going to cry out in my place. I bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I'll bless the Lord in the morning. I'll bless the Lord in the noonday. I'll bless the Lord in the evening. I'll bless the Lord in the mid, 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 midnight hour when I wake up at 3 a.m. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My soul doth make her boast in him. Had it not been for God on my side, I have no idea where I would be right now. But he saved me, sanctified me, picked me up, turned me around, put my feet on a rock, established my going, baptized me in the Holy Ghost, gave me a ministry told me to run on and see what the end going to be. Is there anybody here that might want to praise God for the inheritance that he's given to you? Yes! Let me make one more point and I get on up out of here. Because some of you might be confused. You might think I'm asking you to worship God. You, you might get confused. You might, you might think I'm exhorting you to worship God, which I am. But you might think that's the, that's the gist of the argument. It isn't. He said, well, what's the gist, Brother Bishop? Ecclesiastes 5 and 4 in your notes. When you make a vow to God, don't be late in paying it. For he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. Now, the problem is that some of y'all, when I just start reading it, you just said to me in your mind, I read your face. I seen you. 
You said, but I didn't make no vow. Oh, but you did. Oh, but you did. When you took God's blessing, you obligated yourself. Now, if you don't want his blessing, I ain't got no problem. You don't want to praise him. You don't want to be obedient. You don't want to tell everybody about him. You don't want to jump and shout. Then give back his blessing. Forget about heaven. Go to hell then. But if you want his blessing, every time you partake, you are obligated. Did you hear what I said? I said you are obligated to praise him. So I'm not asking you. I'm not trying to just say this is what you should do. I'm, I'm telling you, you are obligated to praise God. You ought to praise God. You got a re moral responsibility to praise God. You say, I missed that part. It's in the fine print. It's over there, that same fine print you got when you got married. When you read that marriage contract, and read the fine print. You said, for better, for worse. You said, uh-huh. For richer, for poor. Uh-huh. In sickness and health. Uh -huh. You didn't know he was going to actually get sick. You didn't know that all he had told you about, was, as she told you about, was a front, and they didn't have no money. When he said for richer or poor, he should have said for poor, you are already poorer. You don't know what you got tied up in. Anytime you tie yourself to somebody, you better know who you tying yourself to. Everybody so hopped up to get married. I just want me, I want me somebody. You gonna mess around and get a body. I hope it's a living body. I hope it ain't a dead body. You are obligated. Now, I ain't got time. This is not marriage ceremony or teaching today. Well, I'm just going to tell you. So you ain't got to jump out because everything that you're going through right now, you already agreed to. He said for rich or for poor. Better, worse. Huh? In sickness and in hell. Until I don't want to take it no more. That ain't what I say? What I say? Until death shall separate us. I'm good. I'm good. I'm in. Let's go all the way. Let's do this thing. Well, let me make sure you understand what you said to Jesus. When you, had, when you needed a favor. Ah, glory. When you was in debt. When you were messed up, when you couldn't find no way. Remember now, that's when you make promises that you don't, you forget about later on. I, remember, I'm a, I'm a pastor. I done seen more jailhouse confessions than you can ever know. You don't know what a jailhouse confession is? They in jail. You go down to visit them. <laughs> pastor, when I get out of here. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to run for him. I'm going to do what he called me to do. They get out. Don't see him no more. Matter of fact, I had one of them tell me after a little while, God ain't done nothing for me. And, and this is what I did, because I read the Bible. I just got away from him, because when the ground opened up, I'm not going to be standing by him. Because remember, when the ground opened up on Korah and Abiram and Datham, everybody went down. They said, folks, just start falling in the ground. I said, now let me just get back away from you because evidently you don't know what God has done for you. I remember when I prayed for you. I remember when the judge said he was, he was sending everybody down, everybody that day. And he came to you and said, I'm not going to send you down today. And I just stepped back and said, my God, what are you doing up in here? I remember when he opened the door when there wasn't no door. I remember when he walked with you when you didn't think nobody 
was there. I remember where you came from. So don't forget where he brought you from. And when you recognize where he brought you from, there's nothing you can do but praise him.